John 10, I'm going to pull a few verses from John 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them in also and they will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. We need a flock. And I know that it's um, an old kind of funny story to say that sheep are stupid, you know, and we're all being compared to the sheep. Um, And I think that the metaphor of sheep holds a lot of water for people in this time period that this passage was written in. Um, I also think it assumes a lot of knowledge about sheep and how flocks work. And I am going to refrain from making the obvious Australia jokes here. Just, we'll just let that lie right there. But the story Jesus is telling here is about a community of sheep, right? A group, a flock, a group that hangs out together. They need each other. They spend time together. There's safety in numbers. There's a wall around them that protects them. Um, but they, there's a gate on that wall, but they don't always stay inside that wall. In fact, they couldn't survive if they did that. Um, that's where they come after they've gone out and about in the world. They've done the risky things like eat and drink and maybe rest and play in bigger meadows. But they come home regularly to regroup and count their numbers and get some healing and listen to their shepherd's voice. And that's where it gets us sometimes, I think. We don't like the wall. We don't like the exclusivity. Um, Many of us who struggle with organized religion struggle, in fact, with the group identity part of that organized religion. We struggle with the discussion or the reality of who's in and who's out, who gets to patrol that boundary, and we'll get to that. But first, let's talk a little bit about the need for community. And I know it's popular to say that we like Jesus or we like God, but not the people who claim the name of Jesus. But the research is really clear that we need an an identity, that we have identities and we need those, and that when we don't, it's troublesome. And identity requires a little bit of organization. Community demands other people darn them. I didn't swear. There is a seduction to the idea of being spiritual but not religious or to saying we don't like organized religion. It's the desire, in many ways, a good desire to be pure, to not have other people who are messed up, and sheep are definitely messy, um, ruining our experience. It's the desire to avoid pain, which is really understandable to this Enneagram 7 person standing here, primary, primary motivation is to avoid pain. Maybe we like God and we just don't like the people of God, especially the messed up ones. This story says God's sheep know who Jesus is and Jesus knows them. And there's the assumption that they're going to be gathered around that relationship. Whatever we call that gathering, it requires organization, Japhet de Oliveira, right? That's who we need when we need organization. We like the idea of having people who help each other when they need each other, of shared meals and celebrations, of folks who mentor our kids or spur us on to be the best version of ourselves, who know us over the arc of time. And those kinds of benefits that we get in community do not happen accidentally. Someone has to make the potluck roster. And someone has to collect the money. And someone has to decide what this year's community service is going to be. It takes consistency to have spaces where people are quiet and listen to the voice of God. Could, be, could easily be me. Seven years ago, when I was actually here um, in Australia or just getting ready to come um, to spend a year here, I read one of the most significant books of my churchy life. Um, called The Spiritual Child. 
Psychologist Lisa Miller argues that family-based spiritual practices are vital for healthy childhood and adolescence. She's not a Christian. Her spiritual community is within Judaism. Um, but she posits that too many people she knew standing around at the soccer fields, you know, with their kids, were worried about um, inflicting a particular faith for their children. They were worried that they wouldn't be giving them freedom to choose for themselves, and they wouldn't, didn't want to go out on a limb and like present something um, to their children, a specific practice, in case they might end up being wrong about it or coercive. So according to Miller, though, these are the same parents who spend massive amounts of time and money on tutoring lessons, on good meals, on enriching experiences for their kids of all kinds, but they're missing one of the most verified elements to promote health and well-being, practicing faith traditions in community. Miller refers to something she calls the intergenerational nod. She has a fun story she tells about it, as one of the signals of mental and emotional health and thriving, the shared language or practice across generations that allows kids to be connected with their grandparents, aunts, uncles, chosen kin. While individual spiritual practices definitely, of course, have their place, it's the gathering over time with other people doing similar, sometimes ancient rituals rooting oneself in the beliefs and practices of those who have gone before that allows young people to move beyond their own self-doubt and internal monologues to latch onto a bigger story. I heard one Christian writer quoted this way, saying you're not going to teach your children to be, you're going to teach your children to be spiritual but not religious is like saying you're going to raise them to be lingual but not give them a particular language. Communities are vital. Identity and practice across generations are vital. And this does mean articulating an identity that not everyone in the world is going to latch themselves onto. That's not the same thing as being exclusive. Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind makes a similar claim. He's writing about why people disagree, good people, about religion and politics. He says, while modern people love individualism and freedom and self-actualization that come with that idea that's kind of invented in the 17th and 18th centuries, we are also at our core hive creatures, flock creatures. And the group identity is necessary. And he says that this is what, and he's talking, he's talking generally in terms like liberal and conservative in his book, and he's talking about both religion and politics, and he defines what those are, and I'm not going to try to do that or get distracted with that this morning. But he says that the, the c- category that is kind of often labeled conservative is the folks that are helping us to maintain the hive identity. Who are we? Let's label that. And the people that are often categorized as more liberal are people who push the limits and the boundaries of that identity, who come over here and say, let's make that identity porous, let's expand it. And that we need both in our communities. We can't just have constant pushing of the boundaries, and we can't always have constant maintaining of this. So another way of thinking about it is what one uh, particular Christian writer expressed it, that he remained in his tradition, even though he wasn't someone that would always be recognized as being in that tradition, because he wanted a tree putting down deep roots. He didn't want to be digging his tree up and transplanting it all the time in new places every time he saw a more fertile spot over the hill. Our Adventist church has a particular identity. It is within the larger Christian tradition, and I am exercising great self-control and restraint, and not tracing that history and tradition. Um, But it has its own, our Adventist identity has its own rituals and vocabulary and priorities within that tradition. And within the Adventist tradition, there are even smaller, more regional identities with their own heroes and publications and institutions that form the basis for Adventist history and practice and identity in those particular places. So this lets us take care of each other and be the flock in a better way. We are particular as humans, not generic in general, and we are particular in our identities. 
Being authentically ourselves, and that's what we're talking about this weekend, being authentically Adventist, means knowing what we're good at and what we're not, and trying to be the best version of ourselves. And this is true no matter what community you're part of. It's true if you think there's a way to be part of some sort of pure community that will like be everything it needs to be in all ways. Let's have a conversation at another time about that. When we have an identity, we are definitely saying that there are priorities that we're making about who we spend time with, about what projects we work on, about what ideals we're lifting up at any specific time. As Christians, we're the disciple of Jesus and we're part of his flock to use, again, that ancient metaphor that may make more sense in some places than others. Um, And that we're trying to live the life and build the kingdom that Jesus modeled on earth and to encourage other folks to look for the new heaven and the new earth. Together, we create a culture where we hear the voice of the shepherd. That's what we're doing. And we want to invite others along with that to be part of our little flock. It's an affirmation to other people when you say, hey, join up with us, right? You feel affirmed when that. And when someone does that, it blesses us. We only have so much time, whatever we are as human beings, it's people who are finite and running out of time. And when we decide to spend it with people, we are hacking off a part of ourselves and handing it to them. We're all doing that for each other right here this morning. We're just handing a chunk of ourselves and our lives to the other people that are in this room. So we get to decide who we spend our time with and whose lives we pour love and time into. And that matters. And gradually that becomes our identity. A couple of my friends um, who live near me um, invited me along a few years ago to start jogging with them a couple days a week, you know, and we'd, I'd drive over to their neighborhood and we'd jog around for about 30 minutes and talk about our lives and find out what's going on with them. And it was a great way to keep up with what they were doing and to realize what their needs were. And I could show up better for them and celebrate birthdays together because several times a week we were spending 30 minutes jogging slash fast walking. Um, and that was a huge blessing to me, something that I prioritized. But then I started having trouble with my hips and I realized I couldn't jog anymore, that that was causing trouble. And so I didn't go out with them several times a week. And I really loved these women and wanted to spend time with them, but it was harder to keep up when we didn't have a shared task, you know, a regular time that we all prioritized for our collective health. I mean, it might've been nice to say, we're just gonna spend time together because we like each other and let's just make a date that we do that every week. But it turns out that we needed our time together to overlap with other things that were part of our needs for our daily life. Life is complicated and busy, and it's people whose priorities and schedules overlap with our own that we share an identity with and that we make time for, that we have these rituals and practices that we share. And as we get older, for many of us, it turns out to be our families, um, siblings, parents, nieces, nephews, that we show up for and make time for and organize rituals around. And that can often be our main identity if you're so lucky as to live near and around your family. But we also have and want and need identities that go beyond immediate family. The church has played this role sociologically, and those who study it say that the practice of showing up to worship and serve and eat and connect with others on a regular basis, um, and to be reminded of a global identity that we share with Christians around the world, um, accomplishes something that very little else does. We are parts of flocks that are greater than our immediate family. Bob Smiatana is a US-based journalist who observes Christianity in the United States. His most recent book, Reorganized Religion, helps lay out the case for the role played by institutions of faith. Uh, Spoiler alert, he argues that kind of the reason that big megachurches, he he says that are really focused on growth and centered around personalities um, and that lack of accountability for leadership are part of the reason we've had a lot of the hashtag church too and kind of corruption and negative leadership issues in the United States. I don't know if that's a thing 
anywhere here? Maybe nearby? Um, but it does happen in my country anyway, large, large churches. And that's resulted in a lot of the problems that people find with kind of church movement um, in, and abusive leadership culture. So he thinks churches of about 200-ish or so are the most healthy and accountable. Um, and that's a different story than what I'm talking about right now, but just had to share that. Um, he, he amasses the sociological evidence for the ways people who come together in churches are able to do charitable work, mobilize for assistance, and communicate to diverse audiences in a way very few other organizations can. This is because of the face-to-face connections that we have rather than relying on the algorithms which primarily divide us and sort us and put us into echo chambers, stymieing our ability to actually do things for good in the world. People are trying to find organizations that replace the church to accomplish these sociological goals, but without the intrinsic spiritual commitments and motivations that collective worship and priorities provide. And they find that it's really hard for those kinds of groups that don't have that centering of we're coming here for our spiritual flourishing to sustain this regular coming together. We are flock creatures who do better with a shepherd. Two weeks ago, the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists put on a conference to remind Adventists of our particular identity around separation of church and state and to warn about the way we've become seduced by the nationalist discourse. Maybe that's just in the United States. That's what we were focusing on. Um, Rather than working for the good of the world and the kingdom of God. I got to attend this and I was thrilled that my tithe dollars were being put to really great use in bringing in first-rate scholars who study these topics. If prompted, I will talk a lot about this conference um, outside of this event. And you can follow the North American Division, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, PARL is the acronym, um, folks on their YouTube channel to see the talks that were given. But for John 10 purposes, which is where we are this morning, I want to point out the arguments of Tobias Kremer, who is a German sociologist, is a German sociologist, who researches and teaches at Oxford University, and whose new book, The Godless Crusade, looks at the ways the alt-right intersects with the Christian identity and practice, mostly in Europe. That's what he's studying. Kremer's research concludes that Christian symbols used by the alt-right as they argue for cleansing Europe of Muslims and Jews and taking back the continent for Christendom are actually symbols of what he calls a zombie religion. Like they, they take Christianity out of it and just have the symbols. He said most folks who are part of those groups don't have any real connection with Christianity. In fact, regular weekly attendance at church is a great inoculator, it appears, against the alt-right. Folks who show up week after week to hear Jesus' words and to be reminded about the new earth and alternative priorities to material values around them are less seduced by populism, authoritarian nationalism, and other elements of the alt-right. We are a flock who need to gather together to hear the voice of a shepherd so that we're less seduced by the false voices around us that argue for capitalism and materialism. Being part of a smaller Christian tradition means that we hear the voice of that Christian tradition in a particular vocabulary and accent. Adventists have their own stream of Christian emphasis, as do other Christian traditions, and when we tune into that, we can recognize when some of the other streams are diverging wildly. We share the same shepherd in the biggest sense, but when the shepherd is with us, they use a particular way of speaking— and emphasize different themes. I've heard it said that families that have multiple siblings in them, none of the siblings have the same parents. And it's possible parents do speak to each of their children in sort of different themes and accents. When I was growing up, Adventists were much more sectarian than they are now. We tended to read each other's work, go only to each other's events, and have parallel institutions, which perhaps kept us from being salt and light in the way that would have been ideal. We had a strong identity, which could really feel stifling to some people and comforting to others, just like all strong communities in the world. And some folks thought we should get out a bit more and interact with other Christians. And in my country, those other Christians ended up being white evangelicals for the most part. And we shared a lot in common with them. Um, I remember being shocked at my own uh, interaction in graduate school with other evangelical Christians about, oh, look, 
mostly we kind of think and act in a lot of the same way. These are, in many ways, my people. My flock was bigger than I thought. But there are some big differences, I realized quickly. Our view of the church and state and religious pluralism, our focus on the body and holistic well-being, our concern for the new earth rather than using the language of just going to heaven when we die, our combination of evangelism with the theology that not all people have to be Christian in order to be part of the kingdom of God, our apocalypticism that goes along with building hospitals and universities and institutions that are going to stand the test of time, and working through economic, for economic development through organizations like ADRA, even though we say the world is going to end. These are all particularly Adventist. But not everybody in my country's church had the interests or investment in Adventist identity that I did, and that has changed in the last 20 years in my my country, in the United States. Um, We are no longer quite as chaste in our view of church and state as we used to be. Uh, When it comes to things like war, uh, 20 years ago when 9-11 happened, we were much more reticent to jump on board the the bandwagon for warfare than we are right now. Um, My students respond to the challenges that are going on now in the Middle East differently than they did 20 years ago. We've become so enmeshed in a wider generic Protestant evangelical culture with the social media and YouTube channels and music and conferences associating with it that I can hear my Seventh-day Adventist university student saying things like, the modern state of Israel is part of the eschatology for the end of time, and the United States is specifically chosen by God as a force to do God's will. These are not Adventist ideas. They they come from not being rooted in our particular tradition, not knowing the specificity of our own voice within Christianity. Our shepherd has an accent, a vocabulary that is needed in the world. We need to be ourselves in the world, our particular flock. This isn't a perfect metaphor, uh, the metaphor of a flock that has one shepherd. Um, But those who hear the shepherd's voice and are part of that particular flock are going to come and join us. There are other sheep that are not of this flock. But those who hear this voice are going to come. And we can trust that this is what's happening. We can invite people who have synergy with us um, and who might not have a flock to join us. We have something particular we are inviting them into, however. We have a permeable sheepfold and we come out of the sheepfold frequently, maybe even most of the time. But it's okay that there is an identity that we still go back to and that we prioritize. It's not hostile to know who we are and what community is ours. We are sheep with a shepherd. And while that shepherd has sheep that are not of this fold, that doesn't make this one any less precious to him. We can trust that if others are hearing the voice, they are taken care of but we might pay attention to whether they are interested in coming along with us on our journey and learning our shepherd's accent and vocabulary. And as we claim our particularity, we can love and enjoy and be inspired by others who do the same. I'm finishing here with a a short poem that inspires me from the 20th century Ghanaian poet Afua Kuma, who used dozens of descriptors of Jesus in her poetry, not including the shepherd, that wasn't a metaphor from her culture, but always riffing from biblical metaphors. And I'm encouraged to think in my own vocabulary and to speak to my own community when I read her. He is the one who cooks his food in huge palm oil pots. Thousands of people have eaten, yet the remnants still remain. The remnants fill 12 baskets. If we leave all of this and go wandering off, if we leave his great gift, where else shall we go?